Well, good morning, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to an absolutely glorious day on the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit for the first of two races that we'll be bringing you from the Radical European Masters Championship. And we always get excellent racing from the Radical cars around the longest permanent circuit in the UK. And we are on the full Grand Prix layout today here at Silverstone. So it's hello from myself, Ben Evans, alongside me. It's Will Brown from Radical Sports Cars. And the field look absolutely magnificent. And we've got a lot of them as well, Will. Yeah, that's, uh, Silverstone's always a popular event with the Radical European Masters uh, competitors. Obviously, it's a, it's a really good high-speed circuit, lots of high-speed circuit, uh, lots of high-speed corners that uh, really show off the, the aerodynamic capabilities of the cars to their best advantage. So we've got a mixture of cars, of course, today, because we've got the Masters class, where we've got the SR8s and the RXC Spiders, and then the Supersport class, which is for the SR3 RSXs. And we've got one or two of the older style SR3s in as well. So it is Jamie Patterson then who lines up in pole position. The car that he will be sharing later on with Alex Quadra alongside him on the front row of the grid in the first of the Spiders is James Abbott. There is Phil Keane, who I can only presume by the fact that he's jogging towards the car is probably going to start the race. He's just <laughs> been in qualifying for the International GT Open and... So Keane heads towards his car, which is going to be down the seventh row of the grid. We have got a 50-minute race ahead of us, and tactically, Will, that, that's quite interesting because what we've seen already this year in the Radical European Masters is a mix of the 60-minute and 50-minute races, and the refuelling was very marginal on the 60 minutes, 50 minutes. That... The, the fuel consumption is less of an issue. Instead, it's all about on-track pace. Yeah, and uh, what we found as well through the year is that the, the new for 2015 uh, RXC Spilers have just been getting faster and faster. And as you can see here, James Abbott on the front row proving that. So uh, it's going to be a real game of cat and mouse, I think. And uh, we'd, uh, it'll be fascinating to see, you know, particularly in the latter stages of the race with the, with the success second system that's used for pit stop equalisation. You're going to find pro drivers out of position, maybe further down in the order than you'd normally expect them to be running and, and fighting their way back up through the metal. And that, and that always creates a, a fascinating spectacle. Yeah, and I think for the start of this race, we've we've got a lot of the, uh, the, the the amateur drivers who are actually taking to the start of it. So we've got, obviously, Jamie Patterson in pole position. James Abbott, I believe, is doing the full race single-handedly. Then on row two, it's going to be Chris Hyman and Terence Woodward who are taking to the start. And they've both got uh, professional drivers lurking in the pits, ready to take over for them, from them for the second half of the race. There is, of course, in the Radical European Masters, a mandatory pit stop in the middle of the race, whether or not you are doing the race all in your own, you still got to come into the pit. So here is the Nielsen entry of Jamie Patterson. Just getting a few last minute tips. And he will be leading the field, he will hope, into Cops Corner from the, the rolling start. As the grid just beginning to be cleared here then is James Abbott in the, in the Spider, the new for 2015 Spider. Fantastic looking car. Uh, the Spiders winning on their debut race weekend, of course, in Hareth. But since then, as you were saying, well, the outright pace has really improved. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the uh, the car continues to sort of be the, just as just as the teams get to grips with the the slight nuances of the car. It's a it's a much bigger car than the RXC, uh, sorry, the the SR8 that we we see here in the hands of Chris Hyman, third on the grid. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a physically bigger car. Uh, there's more aero. It's an easier car to drive, say, the drivers with, with power steering and, and the bigger platform, the bigger tyres as well. Um, and, a, and a slightly bigger three-litre engine as well. So, uh, yeah, altogether, it's a, it's a more advanced and bigger package. Well, Terence Woodward and Ross Kaiser, after a pretty disappointing 2014 campaign, seems to be going a little bit better for them in 2015. They will be hoping for reliability and Terence uh, a quick driver in his own right could well have that car nicely poised pre pit stop. So here, then this line up with Jamie Patterson and James Abbott on the front row. Then it's Chris Hyman and Terence Woodward. Row three, we have got Manhal Alos and John Harrison. Then Alan Costa and Jeremy Ferguson. Ozzy Yusuf, Stuart Mosley. I think we could expect to see improving from tenth. Then Jamie Constable and the very rapid Marco Cenchetti. Again, look to see him carving through the field from twelfth position in the car that he shares with Marcello Maratteotto. So a competitive first six rows. Then we have got 13th on the grid. 
Sir Chris Hoy, Scott Mulvan, former British Formula Ford champion in 14th, head of Peter Belshaw and ex-F1 racer in the Boss Series, Nigel Greensall, Shahi Nuri and Brian Caldwell, Andy Cummings, Sean Gandart then, Carl Heinz Tiekman and Yap Bartles, who completes the 22-car grid. And unlike yesterday, where we had the SL1 Cup races here at Silverstone, where it was sunny but blustery, so it's much uh, still a day today, absolutely perfect conditions for motor racing, about 20 degrees centigrade or thereabouts as the last couple of mechanics make their way from the grid and then the cars will be set off on their formation lap behind the pace car, just a chance to get a little bit of heat into the tyres before we go racing. Yeah, there was, uh, so the SL1 Cup case of competitors had, had uh, crosswinds to contend with yesterday, certainly down the Hangar Strait. They were finding a little bit challenging, but uh, no such worries today. Just a slight heat haze and uh, perfect conditions for racing. So the green flag being unfurled on the gantry as we get the cars about to be set on their way. And this is... Uh, Start of a busy period for the Road to European Masters because in a couple of weeks' time we're off to the Red Bull Ring in Austria as the the championship continues. But a, a double header day of racing here at Silverstone, which is going to get underway momentarily. The cars qualified late yesterday evening, uh, last on track session of the day yesterday, where again, as you're saying, with it, it was pretty blustery and also really quite chilly. So I think they'll have had to have maybe put a little bit of thought into the tyre pressures. And maybe the setup this morning as Jamie Patterson leads the cars away onto the formation lap. And one of the things I always like about Radical European Masters racing is the, the tactical dynamic as the race unfurls. We've got some very quick drivers starting a little bit lower down the order, but then we've got some also very rapid pilots who will be uh, taking over mid-race. So the, uh, in this 50-minute race, there'll be a mandatory pit stop taking place between the 20th and the 30th minute of the race. So there's a 10-minute window for them to serve that. Um, so for the single-driver teams, they have to come into the, uh, into the box and stop. Uh, and then obviously for the, the two driver teams there'll be a driver change. Now the driver cha the duration of that change is determined by the success second system and that can that can be anywhere between uh, an additional 20 and 5 seconds dependent on their, their place in the last two races. So um, effectively for every race win you're added 20 seconds, every second 15, uh, third place 10 and, and fourth and fifth are both given an extra 5 seconds respectively from the previous race. Um, and that's a, a great way to equalise up the grid and has, has produced some really fantastic battles right the way through uh, the last sort of 18 months since it was introduced. Uh, and also what it what it really means as well is that the, the, the cars that have done one of the preceding, preceding race, they know that in the, the first half of the race, they just need to push like crazy if they can get in some clear air and build up a little bit of a buffer on their rivals. So we're heading down the hangar straight now, at which point the cars leave Northamptonshire and head into Buckinghamshire before they arrive into Stowe Corner. One of the, the, the great challenges even though the, the corner was tightened slightly back in 1991, it's still a very quick entry. And then, as we saw time and time again during the SL1 Cup racing yesterday, the key is to get the exit to challenge on the brakes into this turn, which is the Vale, one of, one of several really strong overtaking opportunities because then you've got that run through club past the Formula 1 pits complex and on towards the Abbey and Farm section, which was added to the circuit about four or five years ago. Yeah, two two key overtaking places yesterday, as you said, is, is this entry into, you know, down in Vale and into club, and then again at, at Brooklands, you know, some of the, the, the best drivers in the SR1 Cup yesterday were, were trailing and braking really late into there and carrying a lot of speed and, and able to just take up a huge amount of, of space that they'd, they'd gained off the Wellington Strait. And talking of the SR1 Cup, we've got a couple of SR1 Cup graduates on the grid today. So Chris Hoy, of course, who uh, raced a couple of years ago, and also Brian Caldwell, I remember from the SR1 Cup, and again, he, it's taken him just a couple of seasons of racing to jump straight from being essentially a racing novice to uh, the summit of Radical Motorsport. Uh, a great indication of the, the Radical Racing Ladder, as you say. Uh, you know, the, the Radical SR1 Cup in existence now in its third year, and uh, Chris Hoy's found his way through from, uh, from a track day novice through the SR1 Cup, and then a little bit of, uh, of UK domestic racing with Radical in, in uh, the 2014 season. And now here he is on the, the Radical European Masters grid and on his way ultimately to Le Mans in 2016. So here is Nigel, there is Nigel Greensall in the number three car, and that is one of the SR3 RSXs, Nigel Greensall, who uh, probably best known, I think, for campaigning the 1995 Tyrrell in the Boss Series uh, a few years ago. He set the outright lap record on the old 
version of Castle Coombe, but has subsequently become very successful in all manner of sports car and GT racing. And he will be, we understand, sharing with Darren Nelson, but Darren didn't make it to qualifying yesterday because, as I understand, he was at a wedding and has therefore travelled to Silverstone overnight. So we'll wait to see whether or not he actually participates in this race. Yeah, as Darren and, uh, and Nigel, of course, better known as appearing in the GT Cup Series with the with the 458 Challenge car. So he's a re relatively recent convert to Radicals. Uh, so we've seen him forming up now with a 2x2 two two grid, of course, a rolling start in Radical European Masters. So it's the black car, then the Jamie Patterson, alongside him, the all-blue spider of James Abbott. On to row two, the red car, that's Chris Hyman, the ex-FPA racer. And then it is the black and blue car of Terence Woodward, row three. We have got Manhal Alos in his predominantly white and black car and the bright orange car of John Harrison. This is going to be quite some charge towards Cops Corner as 50 minutes of a radical European Masters racing is about to get underway here at Silverstone. The first of a brace of races today in glorious June sunshine. This should be a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us this morning as the red lights are about to change. They do so now and away we go, sprinting towards Cops Corner. Jamie Patterson gets his elbows out to keep James Abbott at bay. Oh, there's contact. Abbott goes around, collides with Terence Woodward. Manhal Alos is sent scattering into the gravel trap. They should all continue. And it's James Abbott who's got the worst of that. Alos rejoins, as does Woodward. And Jamie Harrison, Jamie Patterson rather, has a huge lead from John Harrison. Then it's Terence Woodward. Chris Hyman is in fourth position. We've got another car in trouble. It's Alos, who has gone off in the background. He has taken Andy Cummings with him. And so the first couple of turns proving to be a little bit attritional as the fields head down the hangar straight. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Jamie Passon got his arms out nice and early there and, and made the move and uh, really held great track position as he went into Cops. But obviously that little bit of uh, contact in the in the midfield there has, has really aided his cause and he's able to break away and make a charge. Well, that's just showing off from Chris Hoy looking to challenge around the outside at Stowe Corner on the first lap. It doesn't quite quite work for him, however, as he and Alan Costa do battle. Costa maintains the place. There is Marco Cenchetti in the black 29 car. He's doing battle with Scott Mulvan, two uh, feisty challengers. As for Jamie Patterson, this is a big advantage over Harrison and Woodward. Then Hyman next along is Jeremy Ferguson in his spider as the field turn through Abbey on towards farm. Yeah, I was just watching the battle there between Yap Bartles and uh, and Scott Malvin in the in the SDC Lint SR3 RSX, and uh, again he's coming under pressure from Nigel Greensill as well. So plenty of jostling for position early on as they head through the loop for the first time, then along through Aintree and on to the Wellington Straight. There is Jamie Constable, who is in the thick of the action as well. Here's another look at it, and just not enough space. Three wide into Cops Corner very rarely ends well. And as Abbott went around, it appeared as if he possibly lost the engine. Another look at it. Don't think there was contact with Manhals as he came past, but it was a pretty closely run thing. And Alos and Cummings from their spin, as we understand it, over at uh, Maggots have continued on their way. So the field turning in to Cops Corner now, and that is... Yeah, Bartles moving past Jamie Constable. Meanwhile, here is the battle that is ongoing for second position as John Harrison comes under a lot of pressure from Terence Woodward. And Harrison, thinking about the start of the year, was very impressive in Hareth. Very different layout here, of course, on the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. And one will where the drivers get to thoroughly exercise their right foot. Yeah, absolutely. And the uh, the 430 brake horsepower SR8 engine will be uh, used to its full advantage on the long, long hangar straight here. And these cars capable of generating two and a half Gs. We just see a pass there. And it's uh, greatly, beautifully set up there by Woodward to, to make a pass on Harrison. So John Harrison slips down into third position. Now, can he stay with Woodward? And also, can Terence Woodward do anything about reeling in Jamie Patterson? Then we have got just in behind Chris Hyman. And it's this leading seven cars up to and including Alan Costa who've broken away from in eighth place Chris Hoy and you can see the gap in the traffic back from the black car of Costa so here is Harrison he's got Chris Hyman, Jeremy Ferguson, Ozzy Yusuf and Alan Costa then up behind him there's the bright yellow car of Ozzy Yusuf Yusuf just heads in to the loop now and then looks to uh, propel himself down the Wellington Strait. 
as Hyman takes a little bit of a bite of curb. But in these early stages, they just want to make sure they've got the car running as they want, want underneath them and then begin to start picking their way through the field because the, the Silverstone now, even with the, the huge amount of aer aerodynamic grip available to them, does allow for overtaking, as we see, because Aussie Yusuf makes the move on Jeremy Ferguson. That's up to fifth position then for Yusuf. So clearly he likes the way that his car is handling and he is aiming to begin to carve through the field in these first couple of laps. So it's still Patterson who leads from Woodward and Harrison. And then we have got this battle for sixth place between Jeremy Ferguson and Alain Costa. And Ferguson possibly just struggling a little bit with understeer. He's been running wide across the kerbs on more than one occasion in the past couple of corners. So they head through Maggots and Beckett's complex and then out of Chapel Curve onto the hangar straight. And for Patterson, this is uh, a handy advantage, you would uh, you'd have to suggest. 4.2 seconds, his lead over Terence Woodward. Especially as it appears now that uh, Chris Hyman is slowly piling on the pressure on John Harrison as well. So he's really going to have his mirrors full of, of Hyman in the next couple of laps. Indeed he will. There we see it into the veil and Hyman, the bright red car, applying the pressure to Harrison. Then we've got this Aussie Yusuf headed battle with Jeremy Ferguson just in behind Alan Costa. Pressurising. Here is a replay of, uh, well, our thoughts with the corner marker as it detaches itself from Jamie Constable's car. I suspect that was probably acquired at Brooklands on the preceding lap and uh, dispatched at Cops Corner. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> slowly uh, redistributed in the uh, the circuit scenery, but uh, no, no, he's uh, just looking at the gap. Yeah, yet again, it looks like Chris is just a little bit closer again on this lap. Chris Hyman. Very experienced competitor, very Im impressive driver is Chris. He takes it very seriously, very diligent and pre professional approach, and it really pays off on track. As we see it, an attempted move here from Alan Costa to the inside of Jeremy Ferguson, and Costa goes through, glides to the inside. Really nicely done that from Alan Costa. Ferguson looking to fight back in the the foremost of the the spiders in the race at the moment. Although James Abbott, who qualified on the front row, spun at the first corner. He is making excellent progress and has fought his way back into 14th position. We've had one casualty, and that was Andy Cummings, who has disappeared Pittswood after that first lap coming together at Maggots. So the field embarking on their fourth lap of the race. Just over seven minutes in as they jink through... Beckett's and it really from Beckett's it's all about setting up the run down the hangar straight have a look Jamie Patterson in full flow interestingly their uh, last lap Terence Woodward they're setting the fastest lap of the race so far and he's he's some half a second faster than Patterson so um, if, if this pace continues it's quickly going to be reeling that advantage again yeah I, I was I'm intrigued to see how that that unfolds because I, I would say that, that Terence Woodward is sort of over a, a a, a stint length a little bit quicker than Jamie Patterson. So whether or not he can reel, reel that gap in and whether or not he can overhaul Patterson and then break clear is going to be absolutely key. Meanwhile, Ozzy Yusuf has got his mirrors full of Alan Costa. This is feisty stuff from Costa. He's had a great start to, to 2015 in terms of pace and that, that's continuing here at Silverstone as he follows through farm. Is he going to challenge into Village on the brakes? He closes right underneath the rear spoiler of Ozzy Yusuf. And then has a little bit of a look to the inside at the loop. No space there. So Yusuf maintains fifth position. Alan Costa, the Monogasque driver, tucks again right into the toe. Has to come out of the bubble nice and early. Now that might benefit Aussie Yusuf because they're both punching the hole through the air. Depends how brave Costa feels. On the brakes, he feels very brave and glides through. That's a super move from Alan Costa, exactly as you called it, Will. Brooklyn's one of the key overtaking points, and that's the textbook pass. Yeah, second in second, you know, second in two laps, and, and really a repeat of what he just did to Ferguson a lap earlier. So, you know, got a nice toe early with the, the drive uh, out of out of village and uh, down onto the Wellington Strait, and uh, yeah, nice early move and, and just trail all the way in. So through Cops Corner, and Jeremy Ferguson, there he is in seventh. Eighth place is Chris Hoy. Ninth, we've got Yat Bartles, Jamie Constable completing the top ten at the moment as Ferguson now taking his turn to come at Aussie Yusuf. 
Just wonder whether Yusuf pushed a little bit too hard in the first couple of laps, and now he's getting into a rhythm, and it's one that's seeing him potentially being demoted. As the, the gap between the leaders, I should report, came down again on that last lap. It's down to under three seconds now. And Terence Woodward on the march. He set the fast lap of the race once more last time around. Seven tenths of a second faster than Jamie Patterson. So we've got plenty of battles that, beginning, that are beginning to unfold here. Not least the one that we're currently enjoying for sixth and seventh place between the bright yellow car of Ozzy Yusuf, Jeremy Ferguson in the, the Spider. Looks so much fun, that Spider. It just seems to... It looks a very smooth car. The, the, the SR8s have always, just due to the, the level of power versus versus the aerodynamic grip. I've always looked a little bit nervous, whereas the Spider looks just perfectly balanced. Radical works extremely hard on, on making it a very, very stable platform. And one of the, uh, as we just see uh, a little bit of remedial work there, possibly they're investigating uh, James's car after he's off on that uh, on that opening lap. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a car that's been developed yeah, really to have very similar handling characteristics to the SR3 in terms of uh, weight distribution and really sort of neutral front rear weight bias and uh, and a you know a very stable aerodynamic platform to make that step up from the SR3 to a to a V8 powered radical as small as possible and you know a lot of drivers often said they sort of had to reacclimatize in moving from the uh, from the SR3 to the SR8 and that that isn't as much of a case with the Spider. Well, we said it in Hareth, we'll say it again. Free samples of the Spider are very welcome for the commentary team. They haven't found their way to us just yet, have they, Will? So we are on to lap six. Jamie Patterson is our race leader. Second place is Terence Woodward. And Woodward, that time around, was only a tenth of a second quicker than Patterson. So the gap is at 2.8 seconds. Third, John Harrison. Fourth is Chris Hyman. Fifth is Alain Costa. Sixth is the battle we are still following between Ozzy Yusuf and... Jeremy Ferguson and the pair of them as a result of this tussler being reeled in by Chris Hoy and now Ferguson looks to line up the move on Yusuf coming through Chapel Curve and onto the hangar straight that was exactly the balance you were talking about a second ago Will Ferguson perfectly hooked up heading through Beckett's and it gave him the momentum down the hangar straight to eventually seal the deal into Stowe yeah, he uh, really managed to close up to Ozzy on the f second part of uh, of Beckett's there and uh, again tucked into the toe behind the SR8 and that just gave him that slingshot that he needed now, we've got another battle behind because Yap Bartles and Jamie Constable are having this ding-dong tussle and Constable has found his way past Bartles, I presume, along the hangar straight because as they went over the line, as Bartles clear of Whoa. Constable. Oh! As Yap Bartles, around he goes. Over ambition with the right foot there from Yap Bartles, the rear of the car, overtaking the front through club. Has he kept the engine live? Yes, he has. And so he should get back underway. Meanwhile, what about the Supersport class? Well, that is currently being led by Stuart Mosley from Marco Cenchetti. And then we have got next along Scott Mulvent, third in the Supersport class. And he has got Nigel Greensall. And there is Greensall closing right in onto his tail. Now, at the start of that, Manhal Alos was with Mulvent. And that is how that's changed. Alos past Mulvent. Heading in to Maggots. Here is another look. And it all going wrong for Yat Bartles. And the, the super slow motion replays are almost gratuitous and cruel in the instant of a spin because you could see there that Yat Bartles knew he was going around before the car actually did and was, was trying to correct it, but it was unfortunately to no avail. Yeah, right. that's right. You see, it's all right into the cockpit there in the, uh, that uh, rapid application of, of opposite lock, but unfortunately it wasn't quite enough to, to catch the ensuing slide. So here is the battle for the lead of the race then. Jamie Patterson being caught again on that previous tour by Terence Woodward. The gap now down to 2.3 seconds. And Woodward is inexorably bringing this gap down. And Woodward's on a good one here as well because he sets the best first sector of anybody in the race so far on the run down towards Stowe Corner. And then the way that the sectors work here at Silverstone, the middle sector is very lengthy and it will take them all the way through to the end of the Wellington Strait. So it's about a minute or so, and then the, the final sector is, is just a little sprint through Brooklands and Luffield. Meanwhile, the fight for third place is nice and close as well. Chris Hyman tucked in behind John Harrison. And the dynamic here as well, Will, is that for the second half of the race, we've got two very quick drivers taking over in these cars in the shape of Victor Correa from John Harrison 
Alex Mortimer from Chris Hyman, but arguably in clear air through through this stint, Hyman would probably be a little bit quicker than Harrison, and therefore, if he can find a way past John, he'd really like to, to give Alex Mortimer the best possible chance once the pit stops are cycled through. Meanwhile, here is a replay of Brian Caldwell riding the kerbs. Yeah, Chris Chris has always gone extremely well here, but uh, as, as we said earlier in the broadcast, um, John, you know, John Harrison's had a fantastic season so far this year. The the new partnership that he's he's uh, established with Victor Correa this year seems to be doing extremely well. They're a really good driver pairing, and his his driving's come on a huge amount in the last 12 months. And uh, really, we saw it blossoming you know, beginning at uh, Barcelona last year. And he's he's a you know a, rap, a really really very good um, gentleman driver, as it were. So the pair of them head into lap eight. It was another good lap from Woodward. He brought the advantage that Jamie Patterson has at the front of the field down by a further half second. That's now just 1.8 seconds between the pair of them. Then we've got a gap of about five seconds back to the Harrison and Hyman fight. And then Alan Costa remains in fifth. Jeremy Ferguson sixth. Ozzy Yusuf in seventh. But Yusuf has been caught by Chris Hoy in the fight for seventh and eighth place. So that's probably worth keeping an eye on as our race leader Jamie Patterson arrives into the Vale. Behind him, Terence Woodward. Looking to hunt down Patterson as quickly as he can. But of course, the challenge is going to be for Woodward in probably another lap or so. Once he gets to within a second of Jamie Patterson, he starts to get into the turbulent air from the wake of the car in front. And then you have to start asking a little bit more of your tyres to close the gap down further still. Yeah, and as we've we found already, you know, earlier on in this season and in previous seasons as well, that's that's uh, when mistakes get made, as you say, when the, when you start to overdrive the car, and uh, all the best drivers find that the you know that once they can get into a, a situation where they're driving the car subconsciously and just focusing on the racecraft and where to put the car and creating opportunities, that's when the you know it it really flows and you're you're putting minimal steering input and the car you know performs to its best. We just see a fantastic replay here of uh, that's Yusef on. Uh, just just ahead of, of Hoy. So Chris Hyman looks to the inside of John Harrison at the end of the Wellington straight. Can't find a way past. And Hyman continuing to try and line up a move. He possibly can. But we're, we're not that far away from the pit window opening. And that's where the, the different strategies come into play as well. So cross the line they flash. And Hyman three tenths faster than Harrison last time through. Chris Hoy has made the move stick on Ozzy Yusuf, so Hoy up into seventh place now. Yeah, and Patterson had, a, had a, a little bit of a slower lap on that last lap, the 2.025, which means that that gap again has closed once more to uh, just 1.1 seconds now. Terence Woodward couldn't do that again if he tried. 1.111, if, if you're into fans of uh, symmetry of <laughs> timing. But it comes down to a little bit less than that, even through the first sector as Woodward again two tenths of a second quicker than Jamie Patterson as they head out of Stoke Corner, down through the Vale, into the braking zone and then around the right hander at club which will then propel them back after a fashion towards the pits. They go past the Formula One wing pit complex and in to Abbey and Farm and whenever you talk to the drivers the the old bridge corner was always felt to be a big loss here when they revised the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, but they've more than made up for it, really, with Abbey and Farm, two very high-speed corners, and then Farm feeds them into quite a tricky braking sector. Yeah, a real test of your metal as you as you jink through that right-hander at Abbey, and uh, yeah, some of the quickest guys, really, it's it's, it's a confidence lift and, and tip in, a, a really, really brave corner, but uh, one that if you if you get right and you, uh, you can really exploit the aerodynamic and the, the mechanical grip from the tyres here just feels fantastic. So Woodward letting the car do the work, but he actually was a little bit slower than Jamie Patterson through the middle sector, which to me suggests that Woodward is beginning to arrive into that turbulent air territory. Yeah, and he's going to have to be really careful, as you said, to uh, to not overdrive and uh, just try and conserve the car, uh, yeah, the, the tyres for when he, he passes over to Ross Kaiser, which will inevitably happen in the next few laps. We're, we're just 90 seconds away from the pit window now. So we turn through Cops Corner. In the case of Terence Woodward, a little bit precariously. Now, they've got to be careful here 
about track limits because the race director, Brian Poulter, has a laser eye for these kind of things. And we, we certainly don't want the race being, being ruined by track limit violations. At the same time, Silverstone, being a modern Formula 1 circuit, does have these somewhat tempting tarmac runoff areas in a, in a couple of corners, not least cops, where, where there's not really any punishment for running wide. No, absolutely, and uh, oh, oh. <laughs> slightly scary moment under braking there. Just, just kiss the uh, the uh, grass on the outside of, of the entry to Stowe, which he obviously obviously has cost him a couple of tenths, but he won't want, want to be doing that in his uh, his final few laps in the car. Shows he was just trying to make the entrance to Stowe as wide as he possible. Could, yeah. Also demonstrated that if you think you're buying a new lawnmower, the radical SR8 probably isn't what you should be purchasing. As uh, Woodward looks to close up onto the tail of Patterson through Abbey and then Farm. He's not going to be close enough to challenge on the Brexit Village. Here we have another look at it. Yeah, I can imagine that his heartbeat just <laughs> accelerated a couple of notches then as we head out of the loop now into Aintree and onto Wellington Strait. The pit window opening in just five seconds' time. And yes, it, it did cost Woodward a tenth or so through that middle sector on this, the tenth lap of the race. So the order is Jamie Patterson leads, Terence Woodward is second, John Harrison is third, Chris Hyman in fourth, Alan Costa in fifth, Jeremy Ferguson is sixth, Chris Hoy seventh, Ozzy Yusuf eighth, Stuart Mosley is ninth and leads the Supersport class. And Manhal Alos completes the top ten. The Supersport podium completed at the moment by Marco Cianchetti and Scott Mulvan. Yeah, and... Uh I'm wondering here if they're uh, going to change over fairly quickly to um, uh, the, the, you know, the change between between Jamie Patterson and Alex Capadia may well take place quite early in the race, I suspect, if he if he feels that he's struggling to get away from Woodward. Yeah, and that would be an intriguing battle as well through the second half of the race between Alex Capadia and Ross Kaiser, who will take over from Terence Woodward. I guess an element of it, and this is always one of the difficulties of being the leader, is that they may make the decision that actually they're not slowing themselves down, so let's keep racing. But if a quicker car behind ducks in and, and they potentially get two more laps of the pro driver behind the wheel, that then that can, can have a very substantial bearing as the race heads towards its closing stages. And this is one of the thrill element, thrilling elements of endurance racing and, and Radical European Masters is all about giving giving people that, that sort of true test, uh, true taste of, of real endurance racing, the same sort of challenges that are faced at Le Mans or elsewhere. It's that, you know, when when do you choose to attack? When do you choose to, to make your driver change? It's, uh, it's all important stuff to think about, you know, conserving fuel, conserving tyres as well as we've seen earlier in the season. So, um, yeah, there's more to it than, uh, than just sprint racing. So around Farm now for the race leaders and Terence Woodward beginning to just show himself a little bit more into Jamie Patterson's mirrors. And this is potentially the point at which the 360 racing team might just be considering hauling in Terence Woodward because what they don't want is Woodward to overexert the tyres tucked in behind Patterson. That leaves Ross Kaiser with slightly less to work with later on in the race. We're only a couple of turns away from the pit lane entry, which comes on the extra Luffield. So let's see if either of them duck in at the end of this lap as they get on the brakes and head around the never-ending right-hander at Luffield. And then accelerate on their way. And yes, straight into the pits. Jamie Patterson and Woodward are in. Patterson in the black number four car will hand over to Alex Capadia. Terence Woodward in the black and blue 88 car. That is going to be Ross Kaiser who will take over. Also in are John Harrison and Chris Hyman. So Chris Hyman turned over to Alex Mortimer, John Harrison to Victor Carrere. And so the pits are a buzz. The earliest opportunity as Woodward vacates the cockpit. The same for Jamie Patterson. Which means for the moment at least it's uh, Alan Costa that will be leading the race. So here is our race leader, Alan Costa, and because he is doing the whole race single-handedly, there is absolutely no imperative on him to, to peel into the pits. Just racking my brains for the last time that a Monogasque driver led a lap here at Silverstone. Um, it, it's probably either Stefano Coletti in, in GP2 or Clivio Piccioni in British Formula 3, but somebody may well get in touch with, with us on Twitter to confirm that. Your, uh, your trivia is certainly better than mine. <laughs> so, 
nonetheless, it is Alan Costa who leads the way as he heads out of club. Meanwhile, we have a replay of Yap Bartles having his second spin that we have caught on camera anyway of, of the race. But Costa looking really good. Uh, one of the things that I love about the SR8 is that, that you can really see the car doing battle with the grip available to it through some of these faster turns into heavy braking areas. Yeah, very similar size platform. Well, uh, uh, very, very, very similar platform to the SR3 in many ways. And uh, as you say, the, there's a, a huge amount of power for uh, a, a very, very compact car. And you see now that uh, Capadia is back out on track and uh, obviously in the hunt down to, uh, to uh, Costa will ultimately have to take his drive change. Well, we should first of all offer our congratulations to Alex Capadia for having after many years of trying to su succeed in securing a drive for the Le Mans 24 hours next week. And we wish him the very, very best of luck in, um, in that. Yeah, as indeed as this driver as well. Um, Ale Alex Mortar will be racing with the, the AF Corsa team as well in the Pro-Am category. So. Well, it just shows the calibre of driver that competes really in the Radical European Masters Championship. Uh, yeah, interesting to see here. Though, uh, Ross has, uh, has dropped back into this in third sort of you know <laughs> temporarily i guess third position effectively track position uh, on you know it slipped in behind alex mortimer so uh, yeah that's that's not quite as i expected well that that's probably the the success handicaps working themselves through and that is going to leave a little bit of work to do for ross kaiser it also opens up the the question about how hard can, can mortimer push it it means potentially very good news for, for Alex Capadia because he is well clear of this duo. So as the pit cycle works itself through, Alan Costa leads from Andrew Ferguson and Chris Hoy in third position. The super sport leader now is Marco Cenchetti. He will probably go on reasonably deep into this pit window. As then we have charging down the Wellington Strait. There is Victor Correa and he has got yeah, Bartles just behind him. Bartles yet to make his pit stop. So the car's all slightly out of position. So Correa has got a little bit of chasing down to do. So there is Capadia across the line. Now, what is his advantage over Alex Mortimer? The answer is about seven and a half seconds. And Mortimer coming under real pressure here from Ross Kaiser. Kaiser thinks about looking to the inside into Maggots. Can't quite do it. And you can see just how hard Mortimer is trying, looking well ahead, picking that perfect line through Beckett's and focusing on getting the run down the, the hangar straight because we touched on it earlier. These Radical SR8s are really physical cars to drive, but the key to a successful lap time is being super smooth. So the driver's got to absorb all, all the G-forces, all the, all the uh, pressure on them, whilst keeping very, very cool, calm, and letting the car really do the hard work. Yeah, if you if you look to where you want to steer, then the car will go that way, as uh, Kaiser just has another look there into club, but uh, thinks the better of it. But uh, yeah, if you've if you you know you've got to let the car do the work, minimal steering inputs, and uh, and really just progressive, smooth throttle and, and brake applications. And you can be, you can be quite sort of uh, heavy in the way of just see push start there for uh, Andrew Ferguson, I think, yes. Yep. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can uh, you you can be quite heavy on things like the brakes, but as long as you're progressive, that's that's the key thing with these. And uh, it's all about smooth application, even if it's a very positive move. And Alex Mortimer looking a little bit smoother than Ross Kaiser. Kaiser realizing that he needs to clear Mortimer fairly quickly because Capadia. Well, we'll find out at the end of this his first flying lap in terms of his pace. Meanwhile, here is Jamie Constable having his progress pretty emphatically arrested into the gravel trap over at Beckett's. He may have just got away with that. Yeah, that's right. He uh, seemed to go very, very deep into the second part of that complex, didn't he? But, uh, oh, that's a great move, isn't it, from Kaiser? He just forced Mortimer out wide through Luffield as the pair of them run side by side through Woodcut. But Kaiser is going to have the inside line here for Cop's corner. Mortimer wants to contest it, but Kaiser sneaks past and gains the place. The pair of them 6.6 .6 seconds back from Alex Capadia and crucially on that last lap Ross Kaiser was a second quicker than Capadia so this is far from settled they've got some traffic to 
contend with, but we could be in for a really close finish. Yeah, just 90 seconds. Oh, a little bit of a slide there from, from Ross. I'm just wondering if uh, maybe there's a little bit more from, from a tyre point of view, a little bit more in the tank for, for Alex and there will be for Ross towards the end of the race. So, uh, yeah, this is, you say, is far from over. It's about to power their way past Roger Green, who uh, obliges, allows both Ross Kaiser and Alex Mortimer back through. At the moment, on on track position, should should say the these cars are eighth, ninth, and tenth. But that's just because of the pit stop cycles to be worked through with the the cars in front of them. But I think there is Alan Costa, who, as I understand, has had his pit stop. So this could well be a, a battle for position. We'll find out at the the end of this lap. Certainly, Ross Kaiser very keen to move past Costa if he possibly can. And also, what we don't know is, is quite the positioning of Chris Hoy as well. And this is this is always the the tricky factor as well when you, you have the these pit stops coming through. It takes a little bit of time for the timing screen to adjust. But Kaiser in the toe, nonetheless, behind Costa, powering down the Wellington Straight. And he's going to look to challenge on the brakes into Brooklands. Alan Costa, though, having none of it. Both of them moving past Jamie Constable, who is... I suspect probably heading back to the pits to get the car checked over after that little spin. And then Kaiser does the same move of a lap ago to the inside at Luffield. And through goes Kaiser. So it is essentially Alex Capadia who leads the race. In second place, it's Ross Kaiser. Third is Alan Costa. Fourth is Alex Mortimer. Fifth, Victor Crea. And then sixth should be Chris Hoy. We've still got Scott Mulvan and Brian Caldwell to have had their, their pit stops to have worked through. Yeah, so uh, as you said, the, the, the gap between Capadia and Kaiser are fairly consistent at the moment at 6.7 uh, seconds. So the pit window is closed, but would appear as if possibly Scott Mulvan has missed the closure of the pit window. Um, Although he may be all right if he's if he's yet to finish the lap if basically the the rules state that as long as you don't pass the pit closed board, board. then it's it's still possible to make your pit so as long as he uh, he pits on this lap then he, he should still be all right to, to hand over to Nick Jones so the the gap between Capadia and Ross Kaiser is 6.7 seconds and this Capadia has upped his pace to a two minutes point seven three four as here is Another look at Alex Mortimer making the move on Alan Costa. Costa certainly not making it easy for Mortimer. But Mortimer gains the place, but he is, as you can see, quite some way now adrift of Ross Kaiser up the road ahead of him. Alex forced to pass the hard way there. You could see the car certainly wasn't happy under braking as he uh, he bumped over the uh, bumped over the tarmac on the inside of Stowe there. But uh, no, made it stick and uh, he's on his way again. But uh, yeah, quite some quite a few tenths added. Here is a replay of somebody kicking up the dust. And that, I think, is Darren Nelson being propelled into the gravel trap at Beckett's. And Nelson, will he be able to get through there? Yes, he will. Very, <laughs> again, a, uh, a Constable-esque save there and uh, hopefully be back on his way. Well, Ross Kaiser is currently having a phenomenal lap and Kaiser does a 1 minute 58.8, the fastest lap of the race. And 1.3 seconds, that was quicker than Alex Capadia. The gap between the pair of them is just 5.4 seconds. And with 17 and three quarter minutes to go, here is our race leader, Alex Capadia. We could yet be in for a bit of a grandstand finish because... Ross Kaiser is chasing down Capadia. The, the question is going to be, of course, whether or not, uh, as we, we surmise, Ross has possibly overexerted his tyres. So Alex turns into Stowe. He does a 35.6. Kaiser a 35.2. So already four tenths quicker just through the opening sector for Ross Kaiser. Yeah, it'll be this next lap and to see if the uh, the Nilsson Racing team have hung out that board and given uh, Alex a hurry up and, and he really knows what's happening behind him. So, uh, yeah, this next lap really could, could tell us the true pace. So, Pedro accelerating along towards Abbey. And, of course, it's quite one thing for Ross Kaiser to catch Alex Pedro. It's quite another to find his way past him. Still got time probably for eight or so more laps. So the rate of capture we're seeing, then that is uh, eminently possible 
for Ross Kais. We are coming towards the end of the second sector of this, the 16th lap of the race. Now, your race order is that Alex Cipadia will be the leader from Ross Kaiser and Alex Mortimer in third, Alan Costa fourth, Victor Crayer in fifth, in, and then Chris Hoy in sixth. Marcello Maratiotto currently to the summit of the Supersport class, depending on where Nick Jones feeds back in. So for Kaiser, again, he was four tenths quicker through the middle sector than Alex Cipadia. So Cipadia now accelerating over the start and finish line. He breaks the timing beam and gives us a two minutes point nine and Ross Kaiser gives a one minute 59.8 so 1.1 seconds faster for Ross Kaiser the gap is down to just 4.4 seconds as here comes Victor Crayer to the inside of Alan Costa and that is the move for fourth position meanwhile a quick spin for Jean Gandar coming through Brooklands Oh, hope you get that stop before you hit the arm coat. He does indeed, so should be back on his way. There is Shahi Nuri, who has just gone a lap down to Victor Correa in the Supersport class. We'll give you that order once Nick Jones pit stop has cycled through. Now, I guess the question is, can Correa do anything about Alex Mortimer? He's only 2.3 seconds back from Mortimer. The pair of them lapping at a not dissimilar pace last time through, but of course that included the overtake from Victor Crest. Now that he is released into a little bit of clear air, he'll be trying to chase down Mortimer. I think he's going to find it very difficult unless uh, uh, Alex has a, has a moment somewhere around the circuit. With a, with a broadly similar pace, you could possibly say that Correa has got the slight legs on Alex, but uh, as we've seen so many times in the past, he's a, he's a very... Uh, are we just... That's Nick Jones post pit stop and... Fortunately, something has gone a little bit wrong there in the, the Kevin Mills racing car. And he and just seals off at the uh, the uh, entry to cops there. That's a great shame. That was a, that was looking like they were they were really on for a, a, a you know a possible uh, Supersport podium there. Certainly were. So in the Supersport class, then it is Marcello Maratiotto who leads it. Hui Sun Kim, who is in second place, and Phil Keane, third of the Supersport runners, but. Uh, on the prowl is Keane. He should find a way past Hui Sun Kim on this lap if he's not already done so. So across the line, our leading duo. The gap is down to 3.5 seconds. Again, it was about 1.1 seconds between the pair of them. So the gap scything downwards. In fact, eight tenths a second the difference. So Ross Kaiser inexorably closing in. 13 and a half minutes remain here at Silverstone, the opening race of the weekend for the Radical European Masters as the heat haste shimmers off the car of Alex Capadia on lap 18. So by my, my admittedly shaky mass, that should give, at uh, this rate of, uh, of capture, that should still give Ross a, a good three laps with an opportunity to try and make a pass on, uh, on Capadia for the lead. There is Alex Mortimer and Mortimer a little bit quicker than Victor Crayer, in fact, last time around. So that third place for Alex Mortimer looking reasonably secure at this stage of the race. We've got a drive-through penalty for Shahi Nuri, and that is for a pit lane infringement. The first of the spider cars is in the hands of Chris Hoy, and Chris running sixth overall. I think we'll be delighted with the way this race is going. Yeah, it's absolutely and, uh, and fantastic uh, preparation and, uh, and and continued development as he as he dovetails it with his Nismo International sort of rating program as well. So uh, no, great to have the the former SR1 uh, Cup racer and of course Britain's most de decorated Olympian on the grid. Exactly. For those of you, it is the the Chris Hoy of of, of cycling and serial advert fame, who is at the wheel of the 76 car and. Uh, in sixth position he's about 43 seconds off the lead but very comfortable in that sixth place as here comes Correa through Luffield it's been a, a reasonably good lap this from Correa versus the pace being set by Alex Morton so that gap is going to be chipped down just a little bit meanwhile at the front of the field Capadia and Kaiser are exchanging absolutely electrifying laps Capadia does his personal best lap of the race the one minute 59.9 Ross Kaiser responds with the 
almost the fastest lap of the race, a 1 minute 58.8. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, continues to, to, hack, to hack that advantage down by a rate of 1.1 seconds a lap. And uh, this is going to be a really electrifying finale, I think, with just 11 minutes to go. Through Chapel Curve, we are following the fight for third position. It came down by three-tenths of a second last time around. As Mortimer, though, is an experienced enough driver. I, I suspect he won't be unduly pushing his car. This is the fight, though, for the lead of the race. As Capadia getting in amongst the traffic. Here comes Ross Kaiser. And she was saying we'll, he, he will have two or three laps at a minimum to try and find a way past Capadia. They put a lap on Brian Caldwell. And Caldwell sees Capadia coming, gives him plenty of space through Abbey. The same as he unwinds through Farm. As Kaiser also eases past Caldwell. They then head into the loop. They've got a little bit of traffic just ahead of them. That is the form of Darren Nelson, recovered from his spin at Beckett's. Back underway. Blue flag is shown to Nelson. And if we get a cl close up of Nelson's helmet, you'll see it's in the style of Alain Prost. It's a, it's a really nice helmet design that Darren Nelson's got. Well, I think Capadia would rather have not caught the SR3 through Brooklands and Luffield because... Yeah, just momentarily bought there. There really is only one line for, for both drivers and you just finally make a way through Woodcup. But uh, no, that's uh, that's not helped his cause at all. Uh, and it's probably worth explaining, actually, Will, for anybody who, who's watching this who's used to F1, where when a blue flag is displayed, the, the slower car bolts out of the way. The, the instruction the drivers are given in the Radical European Masters is if you're being lapped, stick to the racing line because at least that's predictable and the faster car can find a way around you. Yeah, sure, because uh, inevitably the faster cars will be maybe in a different class. The, 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 you know, the Masters class cars trying to make their way through past the Supersport. So there is quite a big straight line speed differential. On to the hangar straight and the gap down to just one and a quarter seconds at the end of the last lap. What's it going to be? It's down by a tenth or so as they turn into Stowe Corner. And with still the best part of 20% of the race remaining, this is far from settled, gloriously sunny day. Uh, Silverstone. It's through Club Corner. Ross Kaiser just winding up the throttle. In pursuit of Alex Capadia. Capadia, has he got anything just left in reserve to try and to try and pull clicks. So I guess the other thing, uh, the other dynamic here, Will, is the, the setup of the car has got to be a, a compromise that both drivers are happy with. Yes, um, although I would say, I mean, Jamie Patterson, a, a very, very experienced radical racer in uh, in both the SR8 and the SR3, so um, his setup, I would imagine, would not be too dissimilar to that of Capadia's, but uh, no, absolutely, you've got to find that happy medium that, that really gives both drivers the best confidence that they've got to uh, to make the best progress, but... Uh, yeah, just looking at the moment, I, uh, to be honest, uh, Capadia's car looks pretty stable. I was I was expecting to see that moving around more at this stage of the race, and uh, no, it, it looks like he's still fairly in command, so there's obviously still plenty of grip and, uh, and durability there. He's, he's still getting a lot of feel from the car. So, through Woodcut we go. Eight minutes remain. There's likely to be a change as well in the Super Sport class between now and the Checker flag, because Phil Keane is within just a couple of seconds of Marcello Maratiotto. They fight over ninth and tenth. Supersport class lead and keen two seconds lap faster than Maratiotto at the moment. So, even by my very, very shaky maths, that looks like it's going in favour of Keen. Well, through Beckett's and guys are just flicking the rear of the car. Really beginning to reel in Capadia. But Capadia upped his pace last time to 1 minute 59.8, his personal best lap of the race. As Kaiser thinks about the challenge into Stowe, he's not quite close enough. Now this is going to be, I think, the really the true indication of of Kaiser's confidence and his pace as to whether or not he can drive through that turbulent air and start to mount a real challenge for the win. Yeah, takes a quick look there at club and uh, and decides that he can leave it for another lap. But uh, yeah, he, he knows that there's an opportunity at Brooklands and maybe he's just going to just wait and uh, again get the best drive out of the village complex and uh, maybe that's his chance to you know his opportunity to pounce. So by the time we get to the line, there's going to be about six minutes on the clock. It's going to be touch and go whether we're going to have time for three or four more laps. As Kaiser thought he was going to challenge into village, not quite able to do that. 
And this is where the tactical driving starts to come into play because Capodia is the, the leader who's got it in his gift to control the pace through some of the turns. And as long as he gets the exit speed right through some of the critical corners, then actually it starts to become very difficult for Kaiser to find a way past. Yeah, and a really good drive there by Capadia out of the loop. And, uh, yeah, it's given him enough space ahead of, of uh, Capadia to thwart that for another lap. Of, of uh, Kaiser, rather. And Kaiser, he likes Luffield. The car really hooked up through Luffield on the past two or three laps as they accelerate through to the start and finish line. And it's exactly six minutes on the clock. And it's going to be very, very close now as to, to whether this is going to be three more laps to go whether we might squeeze a fourth as kaiser carries the momentum through cops really happy with the high speed handling and now kaiser applies the pressure into maggots looks to the outside the pair of them run nose to tail through beckett's they are about to catch a little bit of traffic and that could really hurt capadia if it compromises his run onto the hangar straight but you can see how confident kaiser is at high speed now capadia knows he's coming he sticks right to the inside of the circuit consulting his mirrors every which way, seeing what Ross Kais is going to do. And Capadia has to be tied through Stoke. But that is going to give Kaiser the opportunity to challenge heading towards the Vale. But again, Capadia knows exactly where Kaiser is. He sticks to the middle of the road. Still gets the car stopped in time. Kaiser just looking to get a slingshot there on the inside of, uh, of Stone. Couldn't quite make it stick, but uh, yeah, he's really looking for any opportunity to get the, uh, the car up the uh, side of Capadia there. But Capadia deliberately very slow mid-apex through club corner. It means that Kaiser had to back out of the throttle, but it's through these quicker turns that Kaiser is so strong. Now, can he propel himself to the inside at Village? He looks for the move. capadia has got it covered in advance. So the next challenge for Capadia is getting the perfect extra in the loop, but he runs a little bit wide. Now, Kaiser should be carrying a bit more speed, this time out of entry onto the Wellington Strait. And indeed he is. It looks like he's closed up right behind him. Is he going to have enough of a toe to jink to the left? Mm, oh, no, he looks to the right. Looks to the right, knows that Capadia is there. But this is where the concentration for Capadia is critical, as it's going to feel like an extraordinarily long four minutes. Kaiser tries to force some space to the inside at Luffield. Nothing doing. Fantastic action here at Silverstone. Across the line, Capadia comes now. And a two minutes one last time through. So this is going to be the penultimate lap of the race if they maintain this sort of pace. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, Kaiser's just got to be careful to curb his enthusiasm there and, and not just get a bit carried away in the moment. And, um, you know, one slight move and he uh, maybe taps, you know, tags the back of Cabadia's car. He, he, this is fantastic race. This is really his radical European Masters at its best. Two drivers at the very top of their game circulating at 180 kilometres per hour average lap speed down the hangar straight they come Capadia sees Kaiser Kaiser thinks about moving to the inside what he's going to try and do is force Capadia to be a little bit too deep on the brakes into Stowe and run wide and Capadia has it covered and Ross Kaiser looking to the inside can't do it Vale through club and Ross Kaiser might have to try something a little bit different here Will because he's spent the last lap looking in all the conventional passing places and found his path blocked. Yeah, he's going to have to get inventive with just a, just a lap and a half to go. And, uh, yeah, he's <laughs> it looks like Capadia's pretty much sort of, uh, as you say, got all the, you know, by forcing him to, to really take a lot of speed off in the corners, it's uh, it's given him a great drag out, a, gr a great drive onto the straights. But, oh, no, he's maybe got an opportunity here. Oh, oh a brief lock up there by Capadia as, as, as he shuts the door. Yeah, elbows out there from Alex Capadia. Forcing Ross Kaiser as far wide as possible. But now as they come onto Wellington Strait, this is as close as Kaiser has been. And Capadia will gradually move across to the inside line. He's going to force Ross Kaiser to the outside. Kaiser thinks better of it. Will instead maybe hope that Capadia just leaves a slight opening at Luffield. And that's exactly what happens. And Ross Kaiser is finally able to find a way past Alex Capadia. And they give each other racing room. And that has been the preferred move from Ross Kaiser throughout the race as the pair of them sprint towards Cop's corner into the final lap. And this is going to be the decisive moment. Who will blink first? Neither of them blinks as they go through Cop's side by side. But it is eventually Ross Kaiser who emerges in the lead. Yeah, absolutely. No course to given. And you can see that Capadia 
Almeida who got the best drive out of Woodcott and uh, just, <laughs> he had the speed, but he didn't have the line. That was a, a fantastic move there and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of bravery from both of them to make that stick. Ross Kaiser pushing very, very, very hard. Here is another look at the attempt into the loop. A little bit of contact maybe, nothing malicious. And then the, the pass, Capadia just breaks so late, understeers out wide, and it just gives that car's width, which was all that Kaiser needed. Yeah, he was, uh, you could tell, <laughs> tell the Kaiser was breathing in there to get the car to fit on the inside of Loughfield and, and, uh, and have the opportunity. So we are halfway around the final lap, and Ross Kaiser has got the advantage now over Alex Capadia. Brilliant driving between the pair of them and exactly the close to the race that we were hoping for. But Kaiser has just got to make sure that he doesn't make any mistakes through this, through this final lap because he has been driving on the limit as the pair of them head on their way. It's a problem for Victor Correa. So Correa has a little bit of an issue late on and pulls off the road and out of fourth position. And that is a great shame. As down the Wellington straight, just a couple of corners from home. And it is going to be a victory for Terence Woodward and Ross Kaiser in the Radical European Masters here at Silverstone. And it's wonderful to see the pair of them back at the front of this championship. It's been a scintillating race in the opener of the day for the Radical European Masters. And it is claimed by Ross Kaiser and Terence Woodward. Second place to Alex Capadia and Jamie Patterson, the pair of them having a brilliant, brilliant fight late on. And then third for Alex Mortimer and Chris Hyman. Just a little way adrift, but they complete the rostrum. And then we will await the Supersport honours as negotiating Luffield for the final time. That is Brian Caldwell. It's the 360 racing team. Celebrate on the pit wall. And for all that strategy comes to the fore, that was down to pure pace from Ross Kaiser as accelerating en route to fourth position is going to be Alain Costa. An excellent drive from Costa as he ekes out every last drop of fuel across the line to take the flag. Breathtaking, breathtaking stuff. No, fantastic race from uh, from Ross to uh, to as you say, create opportunities there. You know, a very very experienced radical racer found found the uh, the opportunity needed and uh, and gave himself you know, really gave Capadia no option. And it it was the, the the just the sheer confidence that Ross Kaiser had in terms of, of the grip available when he was leaping onto the brakes in the super sport class should be Phil Keane who is going to claim that alongside Peter Belshaw and then Marcello Maratotto and Marco Cenchetti in second place with Huisun Kim and Stuart Mosley in third so we will of course be back later on today for the second race of the weekend for the Radical European, European Masters that gets underway at 25 past two British summer time. And we will be on air just before with all of the build up for now, though that was a race to savour. And I think Alice Capadia and Ross Kaiser can feel justifiably proud of their respective performances. Wonderful dicing and top levels sports car racing at its very best. So here is a look at the following results then. Terence Wood and Ross Kaiser victorious. Jamie Patterson and Alex Capadia in second. Chris Hyman and Alex Mortimer completing the podium. Then eighth place Peter Belshaw and Phil Keane. They win the su Super Sport class from Marcello Maratiotto and Marco Cinchetti. The Super Sport podium completed by Huisam Kim and Stuart Mosley in 11th place. Well, one or two casualties along the way. I think James Abbott we can expect to see shining a little bit later on. And Victor Crair, disappointing for him to uh, retire late on. So Ross Kaiser receives congratulations of Terence Woodward and the rest of the 360 racing team. 
So let's take a little bit of a look back at the highlights of an excellent race. Well, off the line, Jamie Patterson got the jump, but then behind they went three wide into Cops Corner. And in the entanglement, James Abbott spun around Manhal Alos was scattered out wide. And that unfortunately put Abbott out of the race. Thereafter, he retreated some great dicing, one or two slightly wayward moments, not least for Yat Bartles, had a couple of spins along the way. Jamie Constable, another driver, to run out of road, this time at Beckett. So we headed towards the pit window. Post pit stops, the story was all about the progress of Ross Kaiser. His first target was Alex Mortimer, and he found a way past at Luffield, eventually sealing the move into Cops Corner. And then the chase was on as Kaiser hunted down Capadia. Victor Crair was scything through the field. Another driver had a quick spin it was Jean Gandar. En route to 16th place. Well, with a couple of laps to go, Kaiser caught Capadia. It was then thrilling stuff, wheel to wheel. Very, very close at times. Eventually, heading through Luffield and into the start of the final lap of the race, Kaiser found the opening and made the move stick through Cops Corner. Fantastic racing. And it saw Ross Kaiser and Terence Woodward come through to take the victory from Alex Capadia and Jamie Patterson, Alex Mortimer and Chris Hyman completing the podium with Phil Keane and Peter Belshaw winning the Super Sport class. Well, thank you for your company this morning. We will be back for the second race of the weekend at about 20 past two this afternoon. Until then, from myself, Ben Evans and Will Brown, it's goodbye.